I mean, I'm only his friend because he paid me 50 quid yesterday. <laughs> Hi there, um, my name's Ian, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, a few things about me, just to tell you a little bit about me. I'm married with three children and they're wonderful, um, most of the time. Um, I, um, I grew up in a Christian home, thank God, uh, with a, a mum and dad who brought me up in uh, the church and in church living. And, um, and at the age of four, I, I became a Christian. <laughs> Prior to that, I lived a, a life of violent crime. <laughs> <laughs> so I was certain that it was just the right moment for me. And um, my, my life uh, was a good life, uh, a very happy life. And it was built around my career. And I don't know if this is the same for any of you, but I worked hard to, to get a good job. I uh, went through university and uh, spent 20 years of my life um, being a workaholic, really, working sort of 80, 90 hours a week, flying all around the, the country, all around the world, um, really doing what I thought was a good thing, which was being successful in my job. And uh, I was a Christian, believed in God, happy with everything like that. But my career was important to me, and uh, I was a director of a company for a few years, and coming home from holiday, uh, my wife and I got, got back, put the kids to bed, and I put my laptop on, opened up my emails, and there was like 900 emails, because we'd been away for a week. And uh, like the idiot that I always was, I started answering them. And I think I did about four, and I just had this moment where I was like, what am I doing, you know, what, what am I doing here? And my wife said, I said to her, I don't think I can do this anymore. And she said, oh, why don't you just resign then? I was like, well, that's pretty easy for you to say. You know, we've got a mortgage, young family. And um, she said, well, that's what I'd do. And uh, I went to work on the Monday, and it was horrendous. Just hated it. Got to Thursday morning, and um, I was just so down, you know, with this job and the pressure and... I just felt like I was in a place that I wasn't meant to be in anymore. And uh, got to work really early, and I was sat in the car park, and um, there was the first person there. It was really dark, sort of 7 o'clock in the morning. And I just remember praying this prayer, and I said, God, I give my job to you. I can't do it anymore. It's yours. And that day, the managing director called me into his office and said, something's not right. You've, you've been a fantastic employee, but your head's not here anymore. So I want you to go home and decide whether you want to stay or you want to go. And as he's talking to me, all I can hear him say is, a blah, blah, a blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm just remembering this prayer that I prayed to God on the same day that I prayed it. This thing's happening. To cut a really long story short, they paid me a stack of money to leave that job. <laughs> but the first time they did it, they offered me a sum of money and I accepted it. And then they called me in a few days later and said, we've been having a think about the money that we've offered you. And I thought, they're going to change their mind. And they said, we want to offer you more. And I was like, fantastic, yeah. <laughs> and then I was waiting for them to call me in again and raise it a third time, but they never quite did. Anyway, what did that mean? Well, it meant a few things. The first thing was, God has given me freedom from a lifestyle of being a workaholic. I run my own business now, and God has blessed it. I earn the same amount of money now that I earned before. And do you know what? That's just God. He's blessed me in so many ways. He's given me clients and business and stuff that I've not even generated myself. He's done it himself. I spend more time with my family. And uh, I've spent more time with people like Martin, Everything has its downside, doesn't it? And, um, but it, it's, it's allowed me to spend more time doing the work that I think God really, really wants me to do. And I stand here today knowing that I'm in the right place. This is where God wants me to be. Not Banbury, but, you know, this is where God wants me to be. He wants me to be doing more of his work. I'm not exhausted running around making money for corporate executives. You know, and, and I'm more useful. And my life has changed so much. You know, a lot of people uh, in churches are broken, you know, and I've had a few of those moments myself, but today I'm not. 
Today I stand living in victory, you know, because I serve the Almighty God, you know, and my life is amazing, and I love it, and I'm very, very happy. You know, I'm, I'm not a, a defeated man. I'm, I live in victory, you know, and, and anyone can have that, you know. And I'm just, we were talking in the car, and I said to Martin, I wouldn't be anywhere else than where I am right now in, in God. I wouldn't have the old job back. I wouldn't have the old lifestyle back. And I just give him all the praise and, and all the glory for that. Thanks for listening. He said, I wouldn't be anywhere else. And the strange thing is, at that moment, we were in a toilet in the M1 service station. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Okay, you're going to do a series on doors, and uh, I don't want to sort of steal anyone's thunder, but I do have this uh, message this morning about four doors in the Bible that I'd like to mention to you. Four significant doors. And the first door is the door of sin. Right at the beginning of the Bible, God speaks to Cain, and he says something very interesting. He says, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is to have you, but you must master it. I was uh, in Kazakhstan a few years ago, which is just a couple of miles east of Doncaster, <laughs> and um, I was in the city of Shimkent, and it was when uh, there wasn't many Westerns there. We were visiting some friends who were starting a church there, and as we were walking back to our little flat, he said to us, uh, don't speak in English on your way home. Because, you know, people think Westerners have money. I mean, not much luck with us, but people think Westerners have money and you, you could be mugged. Um, you know, but, you know, you look like Russians, so just, just don't talk. Just walk. And there's lots of uh, Kazakhstanis and Russians in, in Kazakhstan. And then we were walking home, but, you know, it was a long walk, lovely summer's night, and we weren't very obedient. We started to chat like good Englishmen. So what happened in the cricket, old boy? And all that, you know, chatting away, chatting away. We couldn't resist. And in our part of the city of Shimkent that night, there was a power cut. There was no light at all in the block of flats where we were staying. And um, it got really dark. We walked through the little the, the space in between the flats, around to the back of the flats to go and find our stairwell. And it was finding it. Walked over some broken rubble and things, chatting away. Yes, and anyway, and they said, and she said, and then we realized we weren't alone. We were in a gang of Kazakh men. It was so dark, we hadn't seen them. First thing, the uh, first moment we realized it was when we could smell alcohol. They'd been drinking and they were totally silent, letting us gas away in English. And we sort of immediately became obedient and stopped talking. And, uh, and we kept walking and... Um, you know, try to walk and look cool when really you're scared. It's hard work. So we walked to our, st <coughs> found our stairwell, and we've done what any of us would have done. As soon as we got around the first corner, we legged it up the stairs as fast as we could. Four flights up, got to our big door, and uh, he was trying to find his key in the dark, and I was, hurry up, Colin, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And I was sort of looking down the stairwell, but it was pitch black anyway, and, and, and they eventually found the hole in the door and found the key, it was pitch black opened the door, and that lovely, big, thick door slammed behind us. Good doom. What an awesome feeling. Colin went left into the loo. I went to find a candle. Before I'd found the candle, 30 seconds after we got into the flat, ning, 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 ning. that's a Kazakhstani doorbell. English ones go ding dong, but this was ning, ning, ning. and he knocked on the door. They were knocking on the door. The guys had followed us, actually. And they started speaking to us in Kazakhstan, you know, through the door. And then they started to act as though they were women and tried to put a woman's voice on, which is really scary and freaky. When a drunken Kazakhstani man <laughs> tries to sound like a woman, it goes a bit like this. <laughs> which I think is open the door or something, or we're here for you or whatever. I don't know. But here's the truth. They stayed there all night. And that was a long night for us. And your mind goes all over the place. thought, oh, are they ever going to get... And it's, it's a funny thing, fear, isn't it? Because halfway through the night, Colin says to me, you just become convinced they're going to get in. 
because they're so committed. And after a few hours, Colin said to me, I think we should open the door, give them our money. And it sort of sounded logic. And then thought, and that's not a very good idea. Let's, why, not we, why don't we not do that? You know, let's not open the door. And all sorts of things. We would have been loonies, wouldn't we, to have opened the door to those men. We don't know what they wanted. We don't know what would have happened. In the end, when the sun came up, he eventually gave up and went away. <laughs> and we went to sleep. But you know what? Every single one of us has opened doors in our lives to people like that. God says, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to have you, but you must master it. And all of us, the sad story of the human race is that Cain and every single one of us has opened the door to things and people and issues which we think we can master, which we think we can handle. Everyone does it. Everyone has this, I can do it. Oh, no problem, just watch me. And something comes into our life that completely overpowers us and masters us. And we end up prisoners in our own life, in our own house. We're the prisoners to anger, to bitterness, to hatred, to lust, to unforgiveness. We're the prisoners. Jesus said, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, the good news this morning is that you can get your freedom back. When Jesus comes in the house, he kicks out the evil that we've allowed in. He cleanses away the sin and shuts that lovely door. Gudung. When we experience f- our freedom again, we become masters of our own life. Ian's right. Freedom. God created us to have freedom. Are you enjoying that today? Are you a man or a woman who's in victory? Not the victory of arrogance, just the victory of freedom. Free to choose. Sometimes I make mistakes, but I'm free to choose. Or are you? Do you know that really you're a slave because you've let something in that has overpowered you? Jesus wants to set you free today. The second door that I want to mention is the door of Jesus himself. Jesus said, I am the door. And he who enters through me will be saved. And he can go in and out. That's freedom, isn't it? Not controlling it. Come in and I'll get hold of your life and I'll control you. No, you can go in and out and you can find food and you're going to live <coughs> with me. We were in uh, um, Latvia, me and Margaret, my wife, and we were chatting to this. Um, uh, we were visiting this church and there was. Um, a cross in the church that was the door of the church. The cross was the door. So to walk in the church, you walked through the cross. And when Jesus says, I am the door, he means that what he did on the cross is the way for us to come to God. You know, when we see Christmas in Bethlehem, we see the way God came to men. But when you see the cross, you see the way men can come to God. That's the door. If you had a sat nav and put heaven in it, it would take you straight to the cross. Because that's the route. You go through Jesus, through the cross, to get to heaven. And that means you step through, you take a step. You know, automatic doors, you can stand at them all your life and they're never going to open. For them to open, you need to take a step, move closer. And then as you move closer, they open. As you say a prayer, as you seek God, as you begin to seriously look. Some people stand their whole life at those doors that are real and can open. Oh, God's never spoke to me. God's never revealed himself to me. Well, if God's so good, why? But why don't you take a step? A step of faith. One little step and your whole life can change. One step of surrender. Sometimes it's just an issue. With Ian, it's an issue. Something's not right. Yeah, he's living for work. So he just does one little step. God, please take my job. And I'm a free man. I'm a free man. What is it today where you need to take a step closer to God, surrendering something, walking through? I was um, 
my wife Margaret was bringing some shopping in from the back of our car one day. And this old lady <coughs> was walking down the road. It must have been in the 80s. And uh, she stopped and started chatting to Margaret. Margaret said, I'd like to come in for a cup of tea. And she said, yes, please. And so she came in, sat in our house. And she used to become a regular visitor. Her name was Mary. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of fat kids. We've got um, nine kids. There's always a lot of little kids in our house. And it was the summer holidays, and they used to be running around, and she used to be sitting there. They were grabbing a stick and running off with it. And um, she said, I love coming here for the peace. <laughs> but anyway... And, uh, and we used to talk to her and love her a bit and pray for her before she went. She'd lived a terrible life. She had a tragic life and she was tormented. Very wounded, hurt woman. And uh, we'd often pray for her just to have some peace before she went. And uh, anyway, one day, I'm driving along the road, going to speak at this youth event. And I'm a bit late as usual, jump in the car, booting it down the road. And I see on this big long road, Mary walking down this big long road miles away from our house and I'm a little bit late but I pull over and I open the window and say Mary where are you going and she was a feisty little thing she said where are you going <laughs> I said well I'm going to preach at this youth event she said well I'm coming and I said Mary it's it's a youth event she said I'm coming and she got in the car and I said I'll drop you off at home Mary before I go, but I've got to go now. And um, she said, I said, listen, Mary, it'll be loud, there'll be smoke machines, there'll be music. And she just looked at me with one of those looks <laughs> that said, I'm coming. So I said, all right, Mary, come, come, come. So she came with Mary, with me. So Cool Martin walks into this youth event with his 84-year-old disciple. <laughs> and I sat next, sitting next to me on the front row and it's sort of got banked seats, this place, and a stage like this. And, the, you know, I sort of forget about it. That there is smoke machines, there is loud music, all the things I wonder about. That I jump up to speak. I tell people about the love of Jesus, give them an opportunity to be forgiven, to give their lives to Jesus. And I say to the young people, anyone who wants to be forgiven, go to heaven, have a new life with Jesus, take a step of faith. You come to that automatic door, you come through, you move, and you'll meet God. And they began to come down from these chairs and stand at the front. And then just out of the corner of my eye, I noticed little Mary getting up, getting a stick, taking a couple of steps forward to the front of the stage. 84-year-old, and come to she came to Jesus at a youth meeting. I mean, God's got a sense of humor, hasn't he? <coughs> just a little while after that, you know, Mary died. And I always said to Margaret, she walked for miles, Mary, but I said to Margaret, they were the most important few little steps Mary had ever taken. Because those few little steps took her from darkness to light, from hell to heaven, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. And she met Jesus there and was saved. And when she died, it was a joy. I went to a funeral and I was sat in the car in the car park and I didn't know that Mary had a twin sister. And Mary's twin sister came to the door of the car and I sort of went, oh! And I thought, you know, Mary would come back to say thank you. But anyway, her sister said, thank you so much for loving our Mary and, for, and we're so happy that in the last days of her life, she came to know Jesus. Now, have you been through that door yet? Have you got out of your seat, as it were? Have you taken some steps of faith? Maybe your step was even just coming here today. If you've never been here before, well done. You're moving in the right direction. You could meet God. The other door is the door of the human heart. Jesus said this. He sort of switches the image around the other way. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. On one image, he's the door. You're coming through. He's the image. He's outside of your door. It's a dual thing, Christianity, isn't it? God says yes to you, but you need to say yes to him. He opens the door for you. Now will you open the door for him? A relationship with God is, is, a, is a covenant relationship. It's not a casual relationship. There's a decision to be made. When I married Margaret, I stood at the front of church waiting for her. She came down, and before witnesses, she said, will you take Martin Ruddick? She said, I will. 
Will you take Marvin? I will. It's like that with becoming a Christian. He's Jesus. Jesus, will you take Martin Ruddick? He's a loser. He's a sinner. He's got all sorts of hang-ups and problems. Will you forgive his past? Will you be with him every single day? Will you guarantee his eternal security in heaven? Will you take him on board? Lock, stock, and barrel. Good, bad, and ugly. Will you? He says, I will. To every one of you, Jesus always says, I will. He said, no one who comes to me will I ever reject. So we know Jesus says, I will. The cross is the biggest I will you've ever seen. But now the camera sweeps to you. And God says to you, he's Jesus Christ. Will you take him as your Lord and Savior? Will you trust him? Will you follow him? Will you accept him? And God in heaven waits for you to respond. And only you can respond. And when you say, I will, I do, then you're opening the door of your heart. Something supernatural happens to you. Christianity is very supernatural. It's not just I didn't go to church, now I do. I didn't read the Bible, now I do. Something happens to you. You're born from above, born of the Spirit. It's an awesome experience. When me and Margaret were in Latvia, we went to visit this woman in this flat. We were chatting to her. She was a Christian, lovely lady, single parent with a teenage son. She was telling us her story. We said, how did you become a Christian? She said, well, I grew up under communism, was taught atheism in school, didn't know any Christians, didn't know there was a church in the area, had never seen a Bible. She said, but my life was, you know, a very familiar story. Her husband left her. And she said, I was bringing up my son on my own in the flat, and I was very depressed. She said, and one day I was just desperate, and I fell on my bed and cried out to anyone who might be there. And I said, oh, if there's anyone there, please help me. And she said, I fell on the bed weeping, and I went to sleep. She said, and when I woke up the next morning, as I was waking up, I heard a voice in my head. And the voice said this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Me and Margaret are sitting listening to this story, drinking our tea. We were like riveted. We said, what did you do? What did you do? She said, I jumped out of bed and I opened the door. (laughs) She said, and then I went around the flat and I opened every door. I even opened the front door. And we said, and Jesus came in. She said, yes, Jesus came in. She said, as soon as I opened the door, instantly I felt peace and didn't know why. Within a couple of days, I'd met a Christian who gave me my first Bible and showed me in the Bible where Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Is that awesome? It's awesome, isn't it? You know what? Jesus says the same to you today. He's right here at your door. And his knock is his voice, isn't it? He said, if anyone hears, he's knocking. He says, if anyone hears my, not my knock, my voice. It's God speaking to you. Open the door. And only you can do that. It's not what I say that matters. It's that other voice who speaks while I speak to your heart saying, open up to me. And the last door is this, and you've probably guessed it, the door of heaven. The door of heaven. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Even people who don't believe in God, you say, you want to go to heaven? Oh yeah, yes please. If there's a heaven, I want to go. You know, you want to be the best possible place when this life is over. And that, that, that's why it's so important that now, while you have the opportunity, you come through the door of Jesus Christ. You open the door of your heart. You shut the door on sin. And then you're ready to go through the door when you die into heaven. It's so important you don't miss it. You're not too late. Jesus warns us and says in the Bible, once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door, People will stand and knock, but it will be too late. Do you know, it's possible for it to be too late for you. So I think someone prayed this morning, 
thank you that it's never too late or it's never too and you know as long as you're alive it's not too late but there comes a point where it is too late god has given you opportunity after opportunity and you have not gone through the doors that's scary here you are walking down a road it's raining it's cold it's windy you're walking past some shops you walk close enough to a door for an automatic door to open there you have an opportunity right there if you want to step out of the rain step out of the cold you can there's music playing there's one of those warm little blows that come down in your head you have an opportunity to go through that door and you have a choice or you can just keep walking the door will shut maybe there'll be another opportunity further on maybe they won't maybe they will but there's an opportunity right here this morning for you not to miss something margaret my wife loves classical music i'm a punk rocker i don't know what she's talking about but she loves it and uh, so for our um wedding anniversary one year i decided to take her up to edinburgh which is not too far from us to this for this tea this famous pianist and uh, and this orchestra and they were paid pretty big money to go and see them but you know she loved it so it was all for her as we were setting off, I was saying to her, listen, darling, you need to be quick because uh, time is getting on and we need to get on the road. We need to get there. And she said, OK, um, you know, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I said, Margaret, you know, you need to be really quick. And then she said, can we just drop in the shops? I just need to get one thing. And it went on and on and on. And you know what I'm going to tell you? We were late. And when we finally got parked and got into this massive, beautiful place in um, Edinburgh, they said, I'm sorry, sir. The performance has started the doors are shut you can't go in they said you can go into the second half but the first half you can't go in and we were a dev- and I didn't dare say anything to my I didn't dare look at her they said we'll get you some chairs if you want and sit you at the doors and you can listen to it through the doors so that's what they did they got these two chairs we sat there at these chairs and I was looking at Margaret and tears coming down her cheeks you know what no big deal you can go, you can sleep tonight it was just a concert but he's a scary thought don't let that be you in regard to eternity and heaven Oh, I'll get it sorted. I'll do it one day. I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. I'll keep my own freedom. I'll keep this sin in my life. I won't respond to God. I won't surrender everything. I'll, do, I'll just, no, no. Do it now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is your opportunity. Go right through with God now to make sure that you don't leave it too late. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity you've given us today to come through you into the kingdom of God. And Lord, we ask you that you, Lord, would help us move through today. Lord, help us take a step of faith and go through the doors that you have for us. Help us move today. And why don't you just ask God now, what is the step that I need to take? What is the step? What is it that I need to surrender? what is it I need to do because I want freedom and I want salvation and I want a real relationship with you and I want to hear your voice and if you're saying today listen that's me I'm going to take a step I'm going to take a step of faith I'm going to come through I want to do it then I want you just to lift your hand where you are and I'll pray for you in particular If that's you today, you're saying, I'm taking a step of faith right now. You just lift your hand now. And we'll pray for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for every person in this room today. And we ask you, Lord, that you would help every person who's taking a step of faith. Move them, Holy Spirit, through to a place of total victory and freedom in their life, starting now. Thank you, Lord. Amen.